Hi, John at the Historic Game Shop here. In this video I'm going to discuss chess from the introduction of the game into Europe in the 9th to 10th centuries to the early 17th century. I will be talking about the form and evolution of the pieces rather than the rules. The names of the pieces is also an interesting area which I will touch upon here only briefly but might tackle it in a separate video later. Chess then has its origins in 6th century India where, known as Shataranga, it took the form of a battle between two Indian armies made up of elephants, horses, chariots and infantry, led by a king and his vizier or advisor. Chess grew in popularity in the Islamic world and became known as Shatrang in Persia and Arabia. It reached Europe, probably through Spain, in the 9th to 10th century with the same rules and pieces. The game spread quickly throughout Europe and over the following six to seven hundred years the rules were modified, the names of the pieces changed and the shape of the pieces themselves evolved. The elephants, horses, chariots, infantry, kings and viziers of Chaturanga became by the 17th century recognisable as the bishop, knight, rook, pawns, king and queen in the modern game. To begin then with the earliest pieces in Europe which, despite minor variations, are remarkably consistent and easily recognisable. However, there are a few relatively simply carved pieces that cannot be easily assigned to a particular chess piece, and of course there are the highly carved and intricate pieces such as the Lewis Chessmen from the 12th century. So what I'm concerned with here are what might be considered standard or conventional chess pieces that might have been played with more widely across Europe. These are pieces from the 11th or 12th century in Scandinavia and are representative of the early medieval chess pieces in general. The rooks representing the chariots are rectangular with two curved raised points at either end. The knights have stylized horses' heads on tapered cylinders. The bishops, originally elephants, have stylized tusks. These forms of the rooks, knights and bishops persist in some form or another up until the late 15th century and early 16th century. The king and his vizier, later to become the queen, have thrones, the dome of the seat having a luxurious cushion. In early sets the pieces representing the king and his vizier are similar, the king being slightly larger. Later king pieces have the cushion raised to a point so that the sides appear as two triangular slits on either side and can be seen in this lathe turned example from London dated to the 13th century. Also from the 13th century is this set from an anonymous Italian manuscript on games known as Bonus Socius or Good Companion. The rooks, knights and bishops are similar to other early medieval forms, but the king and queen are turned and wasted with a central band. This feature is indicative of how these two pieces evolve and represents a good place to mark this transition. In the late 13th century, the king of Castile, Leon and Galicia, Alfonso X, or Alfonso the Wise, published his book of games a translation of an Islamic text which he had illustrated with contemporary scenes of games being played. The king, queen, rooks and bishops are similar to those of the Bonasocius illustration, but the knights are of a carved horse's head and neck arising from a domed body. In the 14th century, Jacobus de Sassolis, a Dominican friar from northern Italy, wrote a series of sermons using the game of chess as an allegory to address the morality of the medieval life. These were posthumously published many times, and though the sermons do not really discuss the game of chess, many publications illustrate them with a painted miniature or woodcut of chess being played. A few of these are clear enough for the chess pieces to be discernible. An early publication of the sermon, dated 1337, in German, by Konrad von Amundhausen, shows a typical scene of the main character of the book, a philosopher, playing chess with the king. Now the board is only six by six squares, and there seem to be three kings and three queens. However, we might put this down to the artist being unfamiliar with the game. The form of the pieces is more important though, since it shows an early development of forms that are seen over the following two to three hundred years. 
The king and queen are turned with embellishments in the form of carved balls and crowns. The rook has the familiar symmetrical points of the earlier medieval form, but mounted on a turned pedestal. The knight has a single asymmetrical curved point arising from a pedestal. This asymmetry is thought to represent the feather placed in one side of the knight's helmet when on horseback, and is a feature that is known from chess sets up to the 19th century. The bishop is partially obscluded by a post supporting the canopy, but displays one of two curved points arching outwards from a pedestal. These two points represent the tusks of the elephant of the earlier medieval form. We now turn to a publication of De Sex Alice Cherubim on the six wings of the cherub by the 12th century French theologian and poet Alain de Lille, republished posthumously in 1450 and now in the Vatican Library. The illustration shows chess being played on an 8x8 squared board with mostly identifiable pieces, some on the board and others off. The pieces are red and white and the paws elongated domes. The king and queen are turned, wasted, embellished and look taller than the other pieces. The rooks are clear as the early medieval form. The bishops, though, are wasted and with a wide, flat top with a central point arising from it. The knights, most interestingly, are represented by carved horses' heads, possibly the first illustration of a chess set to show this after those of Alfonso described earlier, and not dissimilar from the knights of modern chess sets. In 1470, a version of the tale of Reynal de Montepon, a retelling of a 12th century story involving a hero and his deeds, was published and illustrated with a series of very detailed scenes. One illustrates Reynal quarrelling with Bertolet, a nephew of Charlemagne, over a game of chess. It is a well-known scene and often illustrated. However, in this publication, the chess pieces themselves have been carefully painted as they fall from the chess boards. There are two groups, one on left and one on the right. This is a fairly unique set, and while it is fair to assume that the pieces become more greatly ornamented from the rook up to the king, it is largely guesswork to decide which piece is which, unless they are placed on the board at the beginning of play. Now, all the pieces have a base, arising from which is a narrow stem culminating in a small ball. Halfway between the base and the ball is the identifying body of the piece. In the right-hand group, there is a king, which has a string of carved beads around the centre of a fairly wide body. This is the only one and would have taken the most time to make, so it's a fair assumption that this is the king. In the left-hand group is a similar piece, but without the beading, and so possibly the queen. Also in the left-hand group are two or possibly three pieces with a simple middle body disc, but embellished with beads or balls on the upper surface. These are probably the bishops. Also in this group are two knights, similar to the bishops, but without the beads. The rooks are in the right-hand group and have a tapering body form. The pawns are simple, small, tapering forms surmounted by a small ball. Both groups have a few enigmatic pieces, but the set seems to make sense and represents a departure from the common lineage from the early medieval pieces through to those of the 17th century. It has similarities to the set of Pacioli, which I'll come to a little later on. The sermons of Jacobus de Sassolis were republished in the 15th century and two important versions carried woodcuts of chess being played. The first was published in Utrecht in 1473 under the title Liber de Moribus Hominum et Officius Nobilium Superludo Sacorum, which translates The Book of the Customs of Men and the Duties of Nobles, or the Game of Chess. As with the earlier publication by Ammenhausen, the scene is of a game played, though this time the king is one of the onlookers. The pieces are difficult to work out. None of them are differentiated into black or white. There are nine pieces on the board and five off the board, two to the left and three to the right. Assuming the kings are still on the board, then it is likely that the piece in the hand of the right-hand player and the similar piece just beyond are them. The queens are both off the board, one on each side. The bishop is off the board, also on the right-hand side, and is another tapering globular piece, but without a ball on top. The knight and the rook are the two pieces that are rather different, the half-sphere and the fleur-de-lis. 
probably the knight and the rook respectively. This interpretation is approximate and others may well interpret differently. More importantly though, this publication of the Sassolis Sermons was reprinted in Britain by Caxton under the title The Game and Play of the Chess, one year later in 1474. It was reprinted again in 1483 with a number of woodcut illustrations, two of which were of chess. One where the philosopher contemplates the game and the other where he plays the game with the king. There are pieces on and off the board in both and they are differentiated into black and white, though there are no black pieces on the black squares for the sake of clarity. In illustration one the philosopher is holding a king and there is another possible king on the table to the right of the board. In the second illustration there is a queen on the board just below the philosopher's hand. The queen is more or less egg-shaped and on a short pedestal. The bishops, knights and rooks are of forms typical of the earlier 13th and 14th century sets. The bishops with the upward pointing tusks of the elephant, here in the second illustration, the rooks with curved and then downward pointing arms, here to the right of the board in illustration one. Also in this illustration is a very clear knight seen to the left of the board, a tapering piece with a clear horse's head, not dissimilar to the knights of the 9th and 10th century chess sets pawns are small domes. This is what the Caxton chess set would have looked like. The chess set has been interpreted in different ways, most notably by Murray in his monumental History of Chess, though this is a different interpretation. We have now reached the chess sets of the very late 15th century and those of the 16th century. Jacobus Publicius in his Ars Oratoria, Ars Epistolandi and Ars Memoritavia, published in 1482, illustrates a chess set that has its roots in that of Amenhausen of the early 14th century. The king and queen are turned, wasted and with crowns, not unlike modern kings and queens on the chessboard. The rook and bishop have forms that can be seen in Amenhausen and Caxton, but on high, turned and wasted pedestals. The knight, similar to Amenhausen, has the asymmetrical form representing the feather in the helmet of the knight on horseback. The chess set would have looked like this. Louis Ramirez Lucanus, The Art of Playing Chess, published in 1497, has a similarly turned, wasted and crowned king and queen. The bishop may well be wearing a cardinal's hat, and the rook has a variation on the earlier medieval form. Most interestingly, the knight is represented by a horse's head on a pedestal, a similar form to the 1450 publication of the Alain de Lille manuscript mentioned earlier. Pedro Damiano published a book of chess problems in 1512 with the knight represented by a horse's head also. And further editions of this book, published posthumously in the later 16th century, have the first illustration of a castle turret representing the rook. Going back to around 1500, Fra Luca Bartolomeo de Pacioli published De Ludo Sacorum, which is most noted for having a chess set possibly designed, but more probably illustrated, at least in part, by Leonardo da Vinci. This chess set is beautifully simple and distinctive, with similarities to the slightly earlier chess set of Reynau, and that for the king and queen, similarities to the chess set illustrated by Damiano. The set comprises pieces which each have a turned base and a narrow stem with a small disc just above the base. Above this each piece has a distinctive shape, the king having two large discs with a point above, the queen with a tall tapering body. The rook, knight and bishop each with a single disc varying in form sufficiently to allow differentiation. The pawns taper from the base and surmounted with a small ball. This chess set has been marketed as Leonardo's chess set, which is a little unfair to the lesser-known Pacioli. In 1507, Jakob Mendel published an abridged version of the Amenhausen's original publication of the Sassolis Sermons. These were reprinted by Jakob Kobel in Oppenheim in 1520 and again by Egnolf in Frankfurt in 1536. These chess sets are those of Kobel and are typical of the German sets of this time and comprise intricately turned and carved pieces. Each illustration has pieces from two sets. 
The bishop and the rook are derived from the earlier medieval form, while the knight of one of the sets has the asymmetrical form first seen in the Amenhausen illustration. We now turn to an illustration by Hans Meilich, one of many commissioned by Duke Albrecht V of Bavaria in 1552 to illustrate the jewel book of the Duchess Anna. It shows Albrecht and Anna playing chess. The pieces are gold and silver and remarkably have connections with the past and suggestions to the future of the form of chess pieces. The king and queen are tall, elegant and made of tiered crowns. Both kings and queens are present, with the two at the front being the clearest. The forms are possibly the earliest of a style that is seen in Europe over the following few hundred years, and is known from the chess set of Selenus, I'll describe a little later. The rooks are of a familiar form known from a number of sets from the 13th and 14th century, with the two downward pointing arms derived from the earlier medieval rooks representing the chariots of the Indian army. The gold rook closest to us is very clear, though there are also two silver rooks and a gold rook at the back. The bishops and knights are less easily distinguished. Within the group of pieces off the board and to the left is one lying down facing towards us. It clearly has two upward pointing arms typical of bishops, contemporary with the rooks described earlier. If correct, then the knights are of the asymmetrical form, though these are a little unclear. This leads us on to the chess set of Gustav Selnus in Das Schach oder Königspiel, the chess or king game, published in 1616. Here we have an illustration of a game where the player on the right looking at us has just placed his opponent into checkmate. The pieces on the board and those in the array behind the board are wonderfully illustrated. The kings, both on the board, and the queens, both off the board, are similar to those illustrated for Albrecht and Anna elegant tiers of crowns, the queen with two and the king with three. The rooks and knights are possibly for the first time together, represented by castle turrets and horses' heads, though both forms had been seen before in sets where only one of the two had earlier forms. The bishop has an elegant form, though possibly retaining the two-pronged form of the tusks of the elephant. However, the origin of the bishop's mitre form for the bishop begins around this time, and is likely to have developed from this earlier form as the two arms become vertical and come close together. As such, this chess set is possibly the first that comes closest to the modern form of chess pieces. There is more information on our website about these chess sets, the archaeological finds, the manuscripts and woodcuts, and the authors and artists who published their work in the medieval period. Here at the Historic Game Shop I make several of the chess sets I've mentioned which you can also see on our website as well as many other historic games, playing cards and dice. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel to keep updated on our historic games videos. Many thanks for watching.